welcome you to, uh, on behalf of the Bloom Legal Clinic, uh, to here to Lincoln Hall for a very special screening of an internationally acclaimed documentary, Shadows of Liberty. Uh, let me first tell you a little bit, this is a very historic room. Uh, there have been many enactments and things here, one of which was when uh, the death penalty in Illinois was ended, it happened right here in this room. Tonight's screening kicks off a coast-to-coast -coast screening tour, the first leg of which will bring the film to 10 states for 15 screenings in 15 days. In addition to the Bloom Legal Clinic, the other organizations that made tonight's events possible are Doc Factory, the Illinois Campaign for Political Reform, MoveOn.org Chicago, Multiculti, Chicago Media Action, the Chicago Green Party, Rainbow Push, and WZRD 88.3 FM. If you have If you haven't had a chance yet, uh, after the film, you're more than welcome to visit the various informational booths that these organizations have set up to uh, get some information. And also, there will be DVDs of the documentary available for sale. I'd like to also thank tonight's organizer, Deborah Brown, as well as members of my staff, uh, Myra Ruiz and Stephanie Borowena. Um, there's, you know, tonight there's been a lot of talk about how on the internet uh, there's now a multi ability to get all kinds of information and we're no longer bound by global media and the big conglomerates. I think you're going to find that that's not exactly true, uh, that global media and large conglomerates still control access to give you the information about all these new forms of, of media. After the film, we're going to have a very interesting panel discussion with plenty of time for your questions. And we're also very fortunate tonight that we have the filmmaker, Jean-Philippe Tremblay, with us this evening. It's now my pleasure to introduce you. It's now my pleasure to introduce Jean-Philippe, who will give you an introduction to the film. Thank you all for being here. Um, it's really an honor for me uh, to be here representing everyone who made this film along with me. Uh, this is a great city. Uh, this is a great uh, learning institution. Uh, this is a great room. Uh, I visited it uh, earlier this afternoon and was kind of blown away um, by this room and uh, felt very fortunate to, to be able to present the film here. Uh, the room, it kind of reminds me a little bit about democracy, uh, a government for the people, by the people, where information is the pillar of a free society. And this is what this film is about. I've been around the world showing this film, but it's really in this country that we really need to show the film and present it to the American public and have a discussion about what we see on the screen and what we see in our streets and what we hear, see, and read in our media outlets here in this country. So I hope you enjoy the film. Stay with us for the discussion afterwards. We have a stellar uh, panel of uh, people who work for our media here in Chicago. And um, once again, uh, it's an honor to be here and to kick off our U.S. tour here in Chicago for the next 20 days. We're going to tour 10 more states and um, later in the spring we're going to tour another 150 cities or so with this film in venues like this, in cinemas, in community centers and uh, having a discussion and seeing what we can do to, uh, to own our media because the public owns the media and we've got to take it back. All we ever get is a veil of distortion and lies and misrepresentations that obscure reality. We have an 
They don't this evening, we have a lot of news to tell you about. Giant media corporations decide what is news and what is not news. Is it to control people's ideas? Is to control their imagination? The news we rely on is in the hands of commercial enterprises. If it didn't appear in the New York Times, Fox News, CNN, it never happened. There are certain events in journalism that you may not cover. There were incidences of physical abuse. CBS decided this is not a story we're going to fight for. All of a sudden, the plane exploded, and one guy goes, Oh, you think it's a missile? It was a complete act of deceit. Well, we basically supported the Bush policy. When that many people die, you owe it to them to find out what really happened. Spying. Censorship. Militarism. Secrets. Corruption. Power. Lies. Profit. 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 This is the mother of all scandals. Corporations are making profit off the killing. You cannot go against the White House and survive. There has never been a conspiracy. Wars really are started by the mainstream media. Normally you'd have an intermission, and I'm going to do something because I grew up in a, in a, as, a, as, a, as a good Catholic kid, um, even though I was, I was straight a little bit now. I'd like everybody to stand up if you could, please, just for a moment, and shake the hand of the person next to you and thank them for being here. Thank you for being a good witness. That's it, exactly. I have a lot of Just to help shake off the cobwebs a little bit. Absolutely. Absolutely. And folks, if I, if I could make one observation from the film, which I thought was really powerful, um, and I, I've seen this film a couple times now, uh, but the, the, the line that we've gone from Thomas Paine to Rupert Murdoch, I thought was, uh, I thought was very powerful. Um, I just wanted to make that quick observation. My name is W.C. Turk. Um, I'm a Chicago author and the managing director of AM 1710, Q4 Radio in Chicago, an independent, progressive, and community radio station. Um, we've got a handful of questions here for our panel, um, which is seated uh, behind me here. Um, but your questions are important as well. Uh, we'll keep this portion of the program to an hour. Um, I'll ask everyone to keep your questions, and we will be taking questions from the audience as well, um, to keep your, your, your questions and remarks um, as brief and as concise as possible so that we can get as many voices as possible. Uh, exactly the opposite, actually, of what the corporate media does. Billy, uh, yes? Is the person from Rainbow Push here? Uh, oh, I'm going to. Is uh, Jeanette Wilson from Rainbow Push? Did, uh, did she make it uh, tonight? No, she didn't. She did. Okay. Um, well, we're sorry for that. We, we're we're going to miss her voice, definitely. Um, and ladies and gentlemen, another round of applause for uh, J.P. Uh, Tremblay and uh, Shannon. Um, and uh, if I could, I'd like to introduce our, our panelists. Seated down here at the end is uh, filmmaker um, Jean-Philippe Tremblay, or J.P. Seated next to, uh, next to J.P. is uh, our own Lovely, and, and I'm so glad you're here. Um, Nancy Wade from the Green Party. The fifth congressional district candidate. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, next to Nancy is uh, Mike Callis from Multicultural. Next to Mike 
is uh, Mitchell uh, Shepanchik from uh, Chicago Media Action. And lastly, uh, yes. Well, Chicago Media Action and the uh, Ministry of Truth. <laughs> Radio program. You were holding that back, I mean, thank you. Uh, and seated next to him is Dale Lehman from uh, the uh, news director from WCRP 88.3 FM in Chicago. JP, um, we hear a common refrain in the corporate media uh, that people simply do not care about independence of information, uh, net neutrality, or media consolidation. Yet the response to this film so far has been fantastic. Um, I believe this film will grow, as evidenced by this room here, um, and, and grow organically. Um, what surprised you most about the response to the film so far? Um, well, I guess, you know, I mean, there's a couple of responses to the film. I mean, there's one from the people. Uh, when people see the film, um, it's actually a very dynamic response. Um, People are amazed on the one hand that we were able to make this film um, and to present it basically with no bullshit. Uh, you know, a lot of people have uh, presented this kind of information. Um, and uh, in a way, like many have had uh, problems to distribute it uh, because obviously most of the um, outlets for films and television and all that kind of stuff is owned by the big five or, or their friends. Um, but, uh, I mean, so I mean, that's been the, the, the response from the people, you know. But I guess also the response from um, um, distribution or the big five um, is basically what you would expect, you know. They, I mean, you know, the film here is divided into several chapters. And, and basically what we say is that, uh, uh, you know, when there's that kind of power and that kind of control over news and information, there's several ways, angles that they can deal with information. They can either on the one hand silence it, and that's happened to us, uh, or they can manipulate it, present it in a certain way, and that's happened to us, you know, in favor of the, of the corporations. So, um, so basically, uh, we've had a really good response from the people and a poor response from uh, the media awards. But uh, this just really- Did you, you expected that? Yeah, it's what we kind of expected, but it just really empowers us to, you know, uh, with uh, Deborah Brown and my other colleague, uh, Zena Bildes, uh, we took about three quarters of a year, almost, uh, it's been almost two years since we finished the film. So it took uh, almost three quarters of a year to really produce this US cross-country media tour. So it just empowers us to do even more, to invite even more and more people to come and see it, and, um, and really show it in the country where it was meant to be seen. Yeah, that's um, so that's been quite sure. responsive. And I want to put our panelists a little bit on the spot here, and just get your first impressions uh, about seeing the film. If you saw it for the first time tonight, or what your first impressions were when you, uh, when you first saw the film. I, this is the second time I've actually seen it, and I think it helps people validate. If it, if it helps, well, I think it helps validate people's sense that there's something terribly wrong. It sort of functions like democracy now does as an antidote to the cognitive dissidence that uh, plagues this society, and uh, I think it reveals many events that have passed through uh, the 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 edge of people's consciousness and never really had a chance to uh, take root and develop into a demand for accountability that's so lacking. We're, as ordinary people, left to be accountable and told we must be accountable, yet uh, the hierarchy, the ruling class, the politicians, and the owning class are hardly accountable at all. Look, I have to admit, this was the first time I saw the film, and I have to say an outstanding job. And also, um, as far as any documentary goes regarding the media, and I've seen a lot of them, this might be the best of them all. Thank you. Well done on that score. Um, in spite of all of the praise that this film is due, um, there are a couple of things that I think the film um, did leave out, um, and actually should be mentioned, and I'll take a moment to mention a couple of them. Uh, one point actually pertains to 
I'm glad that Phil mentioned this, the run-up to the 2003 media ownership rule fight they mentioned Mikey, Michael Powell, son of Colin Powell, as FCC chair, there was some pretty serious resistance in the run-up to that, um, including some that was organized in this very room. On April 2nd, 2003, the Midwest Forum on Media Ownership was one of maybe about a dozen or so informal uh, hearings that were held regarding media ownership. And it was held in Lincoln Hall at Northwestern Law School, this very room, April 2nd, 2003. The date it so happens is seared in my brain because by an extraordinary coincidence, my uncle died that day of a heart attack. He was just 49 years old. But yeah, it was, it was critical. Not only were there a lot of people here, including some folks from the media themselves, um, and, and actually FCC Commissioner Michael Cox, um, who came here and spoke from this very platform, um, the, this hearing and the number of other hearings across the country were all critical because they helped to raise that awareness, to build momentum that actually wound up stopping, even though the FCC actually voted by a 3-2 to two vote to basically eviscerate the remaining media ownership rules. That was overturned precisely because as a court in Philadelphia ruled in our favor. This is the perfect place to be voted. Yeah, this is, this is uncannily the, most, the perfect place. But let right. me the, the, just finish one point. Yeah, sure. the, the FCC wound up getting rejected by the court on that score and the media ownership rules rolled back precisely because a million people, in the words of the court, more like three million people, historically unprecedented number, spoke up about this. Shouldn't that matter? Yeah. And in the eyes of the court, court, they did. And we wound up winning that fight. That's the way to win it. Michael. Your, friend, your impressions of the film when you first saw it. Um, I thought it was a great documentary. Um, it touched on a lot of things that you don't hear about, even though they're very controversial. And obviously, you don't see that stuff on the media, the mainstream media, with the crash of TWA or the fact that they pulled the uh, story about the Nike show. Um, and then you see them with the branding and the corporate logo. And I think these are powerful stories that people need to know about. And because it's too often silence, we really need documentaries like these to, uh, you know, they're important tools for getting that message out there. And also this is a great location as well because the uh, FCC had a public hearing. The last time I was actually in this building was right around the corner, and that was for the merger of Comcast and NBC. And what we saw for that were hundreds of people who showed up in protest. Um, pretty much unanimously, all the people from the public were opposed from it opposed to the merger of Comcast and NBC, and the only people that showed up in favor were those who were actually getting money one way or another from the industry. And that was something you know, very revealing, so it's good to be back here, especially you know, under these circumstances, to be going forward and to see so many people here who are ready to mobilize and actually do something to address this issue. Excellent. Excellent. Nancy? Um, just wanted to clarify my Please. introduction that I am running for Congress in the 5th Congressional District of Illinois, uh, often known as the former district of Ron Emanuel, the former district of Ron Boyevich. That's where I'm running. If you live there, vote for me. If you don't live there, volunteer for me. So, uh, a naturally being a politician, i got to make that pitch. But I am a Green Party candidate. And uh, the issue of media is particularly important for third-party candidates. The Green Party does not take corporate donations. This, uh, this just makes me prouder of that fact. This, this movie makes me prouder of that fact. Um, but as a third party candidate, or, or another party candidate, uh, a, a candidate as an alternative to the corporate duopoly of the Democrats and the Republicans, the issue of media is extremely important to me. The fact, for instance, that Jill Stein, the 2012 Green Party candidate, who was on the ballot in 72% of the states who qualified for federal election money, matching money, was shut out of the debates. In fact, went to the debate at Hofstra University in October of 2012 with her running mate, Sherry Honkala, attempted to get into those debates as a legitimate presidential candidate, was arrested taken to a so-called dark spot, not allowed access to a lawyer, was, uh, with the plastic handcuffs that they have now, handcuffed to a hard chair. She and Sherry were there for eight hours, no access to a lawyer, no access to a bathroom. And there was silence in the media on that event. 
And there should have been, that should have been a headline. That should have been nationally broadcast. So this is a, 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 an issue particularly dear to me as a Green Party candidate. I'm going to grab that back. Good thing I got a big mouth because I really don't need the microphone all that much. Um, so I'm going to start a couple questions here uh, just to get the ball rolling. If anybody has any questions, please let me know. And uh, and I got you first, but I'll come back to you in just a few moments. Um, we're gonna we're gonna get a couple of questions in here. Um, in this discussion, often there seems to be this broad brush sort of assumption. The reality is that America is a very diverse community. Uh, it's evidenced by this room, actually. Um, is media consolidation and corporatization a threat to the realization of true diverse and vibrant perspectives critical to our nation and species? Given a naked effort to marginalize and discredit strong black, other political perspectives, immigrant, gender, and ethnic voices by a decidedly white male wealthy and right wing monopolized media, what does that mean for those communities? And is it simply another means of segregation or ghettoization of minorities and minority voices. We'll start down here with JP. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, yeah, I think the mainstream media and the power that they hold definitely serves a, a, a purpose, a purpose of self-interest, and certainly it's a perspective of uh, a white, male, rich, you know, uh, establishment, very conservative. Uh, kind of establishment, and uh, and uh, they hold that power, and that's exactly um, why they're there, and try to gain even more power, and that's what's really dangerous, is that they're getting even more and more powerful, and more and more conservative. Um, then on the other side, I mean, you mentioned uh, the other groups, uh, we can call them my minority groups if you want. Um, here in Goodman in the film says the silence the majority. Yes. So we yeah. can actually, uh, you know, change the perspective of that. You know, I think she's right when she says mo most of us are against the war. I mean, that's such a simple um, kind of notion to think about and to actually understand. And I think when we talk about uh, these so-called mi minority groups together, is actually a majority, but a silenced majority. So it's about having more meetings like this, more opportunities to uh, voice uh, our opinions, voice our views, and get a hold of what's called the mainstream media and actually break it up so that we have more of a diversity. Absolutely. And um, I think that's where I stand kind of on your question. Absolutely. I'd love to hear what Nancy has to say. Well, that is uh, one of the, the great tragedies of this, this, the corporatization of media, is the homogenization of media. Now, uh, I didn't actually give my, my reaction when I first saw this movie, which now I have also seen twice. It was depressing. I've, I've had a lot of people feel that way. It was depressing. However, on the other hand, the fact that it exists that's encouraging. The fact that you all are here tonight, that's encouraging. The fact that we want to fight this, and that all the people who came and testified uh, against the, 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 the monopolization of the media in the, the previous issue, that, that gave me hope. But these were people from across all political spectrums. That gave me hope. So the, the, and us here tonight gives me hope. Michael. I uh, agree with Jean that it's really the silenced majority because, you know, there's five corporations that own about 95% of all the radio, TV, newspapers, yep. magazines, publishing companies, PR, you know, uh, music, the list goes on. So there's so many people that are really left out. And I see this time and time again as a filmmaker and independent journalist when I go out to different um, protests or rallies and community meetings that really should be covered and that should be headlining in the mainstream media. The media is just totally absent there. So there's so many people who are uh, being left out of the spotlight and usually it's the people who are making important controversial uh, issues more prevalent and for some reason the media chooses to ignore that because that doesn't fit into their model of inter infotainment and the sensational journalism that's, that's going on right now. So it's really about 
like the independent journalists coming together have to be responsible for going out there and covering these events, being on the scene, because if there's not people with the cameras and pictures and tweeting and live streaming, you know, these messages just don't get out to the public. And that's so important because, you know, it shapes the way we think as a society. It really dominates the conversation. And no matter what your issue is, if you're fighting, you know, to, for peace and to end the war, if you're trying to raise awareness of homelessness or poverty or the prison industrial complex, whatever your issue is, if you don't have a vibrant media there to actually get that message out to the public, then you're going to be at a disadvantage. You can't get the support you need to actually make those changes take place. And you know, that's what I see all the time is, you know, the media has just always been absent when they're needed the most to be there and to provide that voice for people. Absolutely. Mitchell. As, <clears throat> as media tends to concentrate, the opportunity for voices to be heard diminishes. Um, I'll mention one um, specific example. Um, it turns out that within the United States, we now have a grand total of zero black-owned, high-power television stations. Eight years ago, that number had been 18. It is now down to zero. The last five were all owned by Roberts Communications, which wound up selling uh, their remaining five TV stations to ION National, uh, Na ION National, ION Broadcast Networks, ION, I-O-N, for about $8 million. Um, and other stations had also been selling off their TV stations. Um, basically to score a quick buck, and the money that those stations themselves are going, were mostly intended to be repurposed for um, the use of their spectrum for cell phone rebroadcasts, or cell phone usage, because that's spectrum that can be used for cell phones. So, um, yeah, we're seeing those are venues for which those communities and those outlets are now gone. And it essentially cuts off those communities. It, it, that's the potential there. And that's where I, uh, one fight and one avenue for fighting to try to restore and to widen those opportunities. We've had some very fortunate success in the last three years with the uh, broadening of uh, and the advance of a low power FM radio um, window that the FCC is holding. So now probably another 800 uh, low power radio stations will be occurring in communities across the United States, including on Apple Report in Chicago. Yes. We'll probably get maybe four more radio stations, but that's hopefully four more stations that we wouldn't have had otherwise. We have to continue and build on them. Yeah. yeah. The question is, uh, do we need more diversity of voices in the commercial message, or do we need uh, community-based uh, conversation that addresses the needs of people directly. I bet most of the people in this room uh, had some sense of what's askew in our society, which is why they're here. They know there's something wrong and that the deck is being stacked against them. I think they want to know what they can do about it, whether regulation is going to save the day. It may have a hand to play, but uh, the time is short and whether regulation is going to uh, suddenly fall into the hands of activist groups that are going to challenge corporations, or it's going to give to those who have money, what, regardless of what race or background they come from, uh, uh, an opportunity to play the corporate role, to have a seat at the corporate table. Uh, that would be played out in re-regulation. So. Excellent. Thank you. I'm going to do the Phil Donahue thing here and run around the audience and grab a couple. This young lady had her, uh, her hand up first. Uh, here with me here. Here you go. So I, sorry, I'll try to keep this short, but I have a couple of things. Um, number one, um, the thank God for the internet because it, there's like two parallel kinds of news um, and information. One is the internet where you can listen to RSN or alternate and, and learn something about what's really going on, news and analysis. If you look at public radio, public television, it's dominated by um, corporate power. Even, even if, you know, even if it's supposed to be public, and it's totally not public because more than 50% uh, of their money comes from uh, corporate funding and they will not tell you anything that's going on. But, you know, take um, climate change, which is like, the greatest catastrophe we're facing, how much do you hear about it in public television and public broadcast? 
homeless, you know, they, they totally marginalize it. They're getting a little bit better, but not enough. And, um, I mean, today, for example, I was pulling my hair out because on uh, Alternet, I was reading about what was really going on in Ukraine, um, fascist takeover of the government, um, Germany trying to, you know, marginalize Russia, et cetera, et cetera. What are, what are you reading in the New York Times? Democracy, you know, is prevailing in Ukraine. Um, how much longer are we going to put up with this? Fifteen years ago, I went for, to a conference on the media in New York, and, and nothing's changed. I mean, what are we going to do about it? Um, did anybody want to respond to that? Go ahead, Neil. I think we should take over Michigan Avenue with the bridge and let the media corporations see us. Uh, they're all concentrated down there. The only thing these corporations are interested in is money. The market model precludes them from uh, when they're not directly owned by some of the bad actors like GE and Westinghouse or the defense uh, industry. Uh, they serve them and they are busy collecting the money that makes them profitable through advertising. And the last thing that uh, people who pay for advertising want uh, is controversy to be exposed for the criminals that they are and for the crimes that they commit uh, on a daily basis, 365 days a year. Only because I'm here, I'm going to go to the gentleman next. Uh, yes, uh, I recognize that there's more interest uh, in this issue uh, coming from the political left than the political right. But uh, I think it's important to uh, emphasize that it's uh, really bipartisan because I don't think uh, this uh, issue is either uh, uh, addressed by either Republicans or Democrats. And so uh, in, in my personal opinion, uh, this film, uh, waiting until the last five minutes to uh, portray it as a, a bipartisan issue, Yes, it hits the target, but in my opinion, it misses the goals of it. I'm going to work my way around the room. I'll oh, try to just to some other people. I will work my way back around the room. I'm going to wait until the last five minutes to, uh, I think you're referring to, when we refer to President Obama. Yes. Um, you know, we also refer to uh, Barack Obama. Yes. Uh, we refer to President Clinton. Yes. Uh, just as much as we did uh, to uh, George Bush uh, in 1998. Uh, yeah, I welcome this film. Uh, there have been others on media. This one has a certain kind of pizzazz to it that I think maybe will have a broader appeal to people. And I'm glad to see so many people here. Uh, there is one thing that I would uh, hope I would have liked to have seen in the film, if I can include that. And that is when you were talking about 9-11, I would have liked to have seen something about thermite, about building seven that went down without being hit, about the, uh, the, the war games that are going on at the same time, about the fact that those guys would never have been able to fly those planes. And I think there was an enormous opportunity that you had in this film to break through. I mean, Amy Good hasn't covered those kinds of things. Don Chomsky hasn't covered those kinds of things. And that's where we are now. We are at this point in our history because the people who could have covered that, who could have challenged it at that moment did not. And we can't reverse what's happened in the last 14 years, but that's got to come out. I think I, I think one of the one of the points is that there's no contract, there's no there's no shortage of material for this film, uh, so you had to edit it at some point. Yeah, well, I mean one of the really tough things about making this film is that I'm not telling the history of the United States, uh, you know, of democracy. Uh, six individual stories of journalists, all at the same time. So I had to uh, make some tough choices, basically. Um, over the last year, uh, I read a book, and the phrase was win-win or lose-lose, and we were talking about a species, the human species, climate. And um, I just uh, began to feel this in my heart. You know, as much as we hate the Koch brothers and all those corrupt corporations, aren't there any good ones out there? And I'm addressing everyone here. 
If everyone here could now say the words, Helen Zell. Helen Zell? Helen Zell? Helen Zell. Helen Zell, Helen Zell is a wife of, uh, of a, a billionaire in Chicago. And she's a wonderful person. She's a patron at the Museum of Contemporary Art. Helen Zell, I always thought you were, I worked at the museum. I always thought you were a nice person, a good person. Can't you respond to this film, Helen Zell? Can you hear me, Helen Zell? Can't you respond to the good will of this film? Don't we need, Helen Zell, a free media? Thank you, brother. Uh, does anybody want to respond to that? Is this the same, is this a relative of Sam Zell's? It is Sam Zell's wife. Okay. Um, the folks, the trash, the trash. Yeah, yeah. Do folks here know who Sam Zell is? Living in Chicago. Yeah. Yes, no, kind of. Okay. Um, Sam Zell had been the owner of the Tribune in the wake of actually the media fight. The Tribune gambled tremendously on the FCC's media ownership fight in 2003. They were banking on those rules to go away because they were planning a growth trajectory on that score. Um, but they didn't get it. And what wound up happening was the Tribune effectively collapsed. Uh, the collapse came in the form of a shareholder revolt. Sam Zell, billionaire uh, media mogul, mostly through re real, real estate. estate. Yeah, his big thing was real estate. Wound up getting ownership, and he wound up actually uh, running the company into bankruptcy from which it wound up emerging and splitting in two. So, and, and the working our way backwards, this was all the result of the media activism that people in this room 11 years ago, which I'm, I'm very lucky to count myself as a part, have been a part of. The, the role here about Helen Zell is, I guess, tied in with the Sam Zell and the co connection to the Tribune on all of this. That the Tribune was banking their future on getting these ownership rule changes passed, and we stopped them. That's a victory. And, and, you know, that's something that we should celebrate in law, and that's something we were able to do. Excellent. Thank you. Yes, sir. First of all, I think we should recognize Northwestern University and the whole school for uh, housing this uh, conference. This is most unusual. Uh, then a question. But would you agree that the main value, the main business, of the mass media is to manufacture the notion of being a free press <laughs> and then advertise it all over and bring more the people to believe that we in the United States have a free press, a democratic press, unlike any other country in the world. And I think that's the main poison. And I would like to see the announcing that and, and somewhat bringing the people in the industry to the level of people in most of the country that don't believe that the, the president just swallow the things as we do in this country. Thank you. Thank you, brother. I'd like to address that because I thought the film actually did so when it uh, covered the uh, experience of Gary Webb uh, that uh, eventually led to his dis crediting by the mainstream media, even though uh, the story he told was fully validated by the CIA itself, how they were <coughs> complicit with drug running and uh, the cover up of it. Um, they covered that, perhaps you want, would want more, uh, I don't know, in depth. The film is pretty, uh, pretty complex in telling the stories that, that it does tell. And it, it has a limited time for each individual story. But they did cover that, and uh, I agree with you fully. The nature of how this system works is to create the illusion that uh, we have a free press. It's free until you start to uh, really create waves and challenge things, just like Occupy was free to exercise its Second Amendment uh, rights. First Amendment. First Amendment rights. <laughs> well, it's second amendment, right? They are entitled to carry guns too. <laughs> Free until they started to create waves that uh, frightened people in this country. And then you can see how it was covered by, by the mainstream media. Michael, go ahead, Mike. 
Yeah, I mean, another thing is with uh, the press. I mean, one, we mentioned that they own our public airwaves, which is the free press. You know, that should belong to all of us. It should be this free channel of information. But instead, you know, they, we've leased them under this supposed obligation of public service, which have, you know, been, it's been eroded so much that there isn't really that public service. Yeah. The only obligation that they have right now is to make profit for their shareholders. And that has a real conflict of interest, especially when you have these advertisers that are making these contracts where if you want to get this money and have our product on your show, you can't have any negative publicity towards that company. So there's that serious conflict of interest where you can't get out those stories and money is a, a major factor in that. And, uh, for Nancy, I think um, if you're going to get anywhere with the Green Party, maybe you should have the Enzo L outfits. <laughs> well, yeah, as I mentioned, we don't take corporate donations, so I won't be wearing a Pennzoil jacket anytime soon, or a Nike one, or anything like that. Um, but, uh, and, and the, the question of, with the Green Party is also always, well, if you're not going to take the corporate donations, what are you going to do? Well, it's, it's a double-edged sword. We can go farther on individual donations, the Green Party does go farther on individual donations. Um, but we have to have a lot of votes, so getting the word out, it becomes very challenging. But one of the things that, that I wanted to uh, bring out was, um, I was part of the, the March on NATO, as thousands of other people were, maybe some of the people in this room. Uh, yeah, and um, I, at the very end of that march, I, I did not want to be part of what I, what I saw developing, uh, it was quite frightening. There, there were Chicago City buses with on the marquee says, Chicago, my kind of town. Cannot imagine how surreal this was. To see these city buses moving farther and farther in on us marchers, doing what they call kettling. So moving people in farther and closer and closer together, and it became quite frightening about whether or not you'd be able to escape from this, this moving fence. And then uh, we did leave and go to a nearby restaurant to watch the end of the march. It was very, very obvious, even from the corporate media, the police brutality that was occurring at the end of that march. Marchers who were not, who were not resisting being beaten with batons, and it's on corporate media. And yeah. right, to bring it bring full circle uh, back to JP's film, um, we saw complicity, we saw a partnership, not only between the authorities, if people recall the red zone downtown in which uh, they, they created a sense of fear and panic, um, but th there, was a, there was a partnership between the media and between the authorities to divert the message of the protesters to what was actually happening um, behind closed doors, vast sums of money being paid off for war by countries, by and large, that were that were um, cutting social love programs. Yeah. Right, and but my point is, this amazingly, this police brutality was actually being broadcast. But my question is, if people saw that, did you call? those stations and ask them, why are you reporting this so, so positively? And the reporting was all about how great the police were, how fabulous our police yes, were. On WBEZ, the reporting was how fabulous the police were, good job. It was obvious to anyone with eyeballs that the police were brutalizing people for no reason. So my, my challenge really is, and, and I know many of you are, doubtless are activists, my challenge really is, is for us as individuals to call them on it repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly. Don't just sit back and go, oh, oh well, I'll just turn to alternate. Call them on it. I've seen it, that's right. Uh, we're gonna move quickly around the room to get as many questions as possible, so try to keep brief. So, obviously the whole thing that I to criticize the mass media, so my question is, are there any mass media organizations that you see as uh, able to, I mean, perhaps able to maintain their integrity and uh, also to follow up, uh, if there's any way to hope for the future that will uh, be able to cover some of the bad things that, that have been highlighted in this question. I'll, I'll mention one particular example that's been able to maintain its integrity, The Guardian. 
Um, and about that, and the Guardian of London, which had been until uh, a couple months back, and then uh, Glenn Greenwald's very avenue for distributing um, Edward Snowden's leaks uh, to a worldwide audience, including here in the United States, which helped to change the game. Um, as far as what the best hope might be, and this actually dovetails to Edward Snowden, whistleblowers. Uh, the people who happen to be in power, we were lucky enough to see Sibel Edmonds um, on this film, but the people in power who are able to shine a light, and the way that Edward Snowden had done it was um, very effective, and there's more coming, hopefully we'll continue on that. We need to foment that, and also in particular, as a quick follow-up, foment that among these media outlets themselves. I bet you that there are a ton of, there's ton, a ton of dirt on Comcast. Let's see if we can do what we can to help to get some of that out, and maybe we can stop their supposed buy out of time on cable. Just a thought. Okay. Um, I just wanted to I just saw this film about three weeks ago. Well, I was just going to say, I was just going to add to that because I think that's a very good place to, to start. But as well, here in the United States, let's not forget that in the past uh, 10, 15 years, there's been a real uh, kind of bursting of new independent media. Uh, and, you know, if you look up the media consortium, uh, you know, they represent about uh, 50 to 100 <coughs> independent media organizations. That are mostly based here in the United States, and uh, of course, there's, there's stuff like um, the Center for Public Integrity or Democracy Now, uh, all sorts of independent uh, media organizations trying to keep power accountable. And to, uh, you can start by looking up by looking at our website, see who uh, the contributors in the film are, uh, follow their organizations, and we also have a take action session of our website. I'm looking at that, and that's a really good start for this kind of research. What is, what's your website? W, w. Uh, uh, the website is shadowsofliberty.org, so it's the title of film.org. Okay, I think I want to follow on what you just said, or you just preempted me. I saw this about three or four weeks ago, and I immediately thought, well, we've got to get this out. And uh, I just have one question for every single person that's still left in this room. What can you do with your family, your church, your dorm, your, I don't know, sorority fraternity, or whatever other organizations you belong to? I think each one of us has a responsibility to do something to get this seen by a lot more eyeballs than just us. I have a journalism class. I know you. <laughs> You're just all trouble. <laughs> all can do something, and I think this organization is very open to sharing the film in some way or other that you're going to cost an arm of leg, and... Yeah. I think, I think Jim, he would say, give the gift of the DVD. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you forget. I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, um, because you're a capitalist, too. Public libraries That's not love this stuff. Contact your public library. They love this. Yes. Well, we're, we're trying to promote the film uh, via this tour. And, uh, you know, if you look at our website, uh, we do have a. Uh, exactly. And then we're going to have 171 screens. So, by all means, do spread the word. I mean, we can't talk about this film enough so that the message gets out there that, you know, we are thinking about the media and stuff is actually happening and people are actually gathering together. Um, I also want to mention that the people I'm sitting with here represent a number of independent media organizations and also our moderator right there. And I'm always amazed by how, when I travel around this country, I found out about these new new organizations, people that are um, you know, producing new media. So it just takes a little bit of effort to actually research that. And uh, of course there's our film as well. So. Um, absolutely, let's get out there. Let's just begin very slowly. Go on the internet. Go, you know, start talking to your friends on Facebook, on, on Twitter, things like that. Let them know about this and, and, and let's repeat ourselves. That's the thing. If we repeat ourselves as much as the mainstream media, we'd be miles ahead because they just hit us over the head every second of the day with their crap. So let's reverse the trend. I want to check real quickly uh, that we're on our time because uh, I want to get as many people. One oh, last yeah. question. Oh, one last question? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to go to. Um, hey, Bill, if I could comment on that real quick. Uh, please, while I'm running around. Just here, um, to make a quick pitch for Chicago Media Action. You know, that's the organization.
organization right here in Chicago that's specifically designed to deal with media issues. And right now we're like re-energizing the group and we're trying to make media like an issue on the social justice agenda. Because too often we have people who are protesting about the environment and tire sense, fracking, the war, you name it. There's everyone protesting all these issues, but no one's really been raising that much hell about the media. And that's one thing that everyone has in common. If, if you need to, whatever your cause is, without a vibrant media, people aren't likely to know about it. So uh, one thing we've been doing recently, uh, we actually organized a march against mainstream media on November 16th, where we did a little tour through Chicago of all the major media networks and kind of run our grievances with all the companies. And this was kind of like a publicity tool to raise awareness of the media, but it was also an experiment to see what would happen if people actually protested the media. Would they cover the story or would they not? And <laughs> yeah, obviously, they? they did not cover the story. <laughs> uh, we're in front of CBS News, where you, know, you can hold up your sign in their windows and say, hi, Ma, happy birthday, and this and that. <laughs> when we had our signs that said, report the truth, not lies, well, they brought down the curtains and they uh, silenced it up. But fortunately, we were there with our cameras for Chicago Indie Media, and we documented this whole experiment. And we kind of show, you know, how they react when you raise this issue. But that's something that we're trying to do. We're really trying to mobilize people right here in Chicago to join this campaign to take it to the streets and make it an issue to put pressure on them. And we've created a, we have the website ChicagoMediaAction.org. We got some pamphlets out front. Uh, there's a Facebook page. And it's also a great network to keep in touch with other local media activists because we have to grow in numbers and we need more and more people to get involved. Excellent. So we post a lot of stuff on the site that you can share with your friends and family and hopefully we can take this stuff and make it go viral and really make media an issue that a lot of people are concerned about. Good man, I'm going to impose upon Deborah's charity here and try to get in two very quick last questions. Just a really quick question. I don't know if it, it was already answered uh, with the uh, response of the Guardian of London, but you know, I, I live in Chicago. I'm guilty of reading the Tribune and the New York Times uh, newspaper. What other source can I turn to for the truth? Is it the Guardian of London? Do they cover, you know, domestic issues? Or I, I, I guess I'm a little ignorant about that. I, I think that uh, you won't find it in the truth in any single source, and you won't find it in the corporate media because that's not their purpose, especially if it is contrary to their profit and their uh, domination. I, I don't read that, but I tell you, I do find lots of articles aggregated at uh, a website called Common Dreams and lots of analysis at a website called Counterpunch, as well as Truth Dig, where Chris Hedge, Hedges, who used to write for the New York Times until he was uh, offered an exit because his reporting was too accurate. So, I'll, I'll plug a couple of websites. The Chicago Independent Media Center I mentioned, chicago.indymedia.org, I-N-D-Y-M-E-D-I-A. So, chicago.indymedia.org. Um, there are, um, a website called Gaper's Block, that folks may be familiar with. Um, that covers a lot of local issues. They also have done a reasonably good job about covering a lot of social justice issues as of late. So they, they're sometimes worth a read as well. Excellent. What's that name again? Gaper's Block. <laughs> Chicago.indymedia, spelled I N D Y M E D I A dot org, the Chicago Independent Media Center. What about it's an open source What? In these times. In these yeah, times. Also yeah. It's also a, that's a national publication but based in Chicago, in these times.com. Thanks for the random. One last question. Hello there. Uh, my name is Nathan Bell, and uh, as a guy who does uh, read the media in the morning and present to people via a radio <coughs> station, uh, in terms of you can get, it seems like a lot of news sometimes worldly or globally, and sometimes locally here. And you have a lot of these, you talk to these upstart radio stations and upstart media outlets out there. Is there currently a coalition or some kind of an organization to bind those all together and become an actual force against these major five? Because it seems like enough small little things coming up can become one big thing. Does that currently exist? And how can we best utilize that to really uh, make it a force? The closest example I can think of to what you're describing might be Democracy Now! democracynow.org. Not only does it air on WZRD, and also on WCPT locally, and on CAN-TV. 
Cable Channel 19 every morning at 7 a.m. live. Um, and on the internet too, at democracynow.org. That they've grown to about 1,200 stations from an original broadcast footprint of maybe like seven stations to about 1,200. To now an international broadcast footprint and, and across the United States. That, that might be the closest thing to what you're describing about. And they're also both formal and informal coalitions with lots of groups um, around the country and around the world. Maybe there isn't something that has been you know, exactly formalized, but you know, networks are out there. They're connecting with each other and hopefully doing what they can to grow. Um, one more pitch is for Chicago independent media. And what we're trying to do in Chicago is to create that collective of independent journalists, filmmakers, photographers, uh, because when I go out to these events, and mainstream media is totally absent, there might be a dozen people there taking pictures and with their video cameras, and I think that's the overall message, that we can't count on them to offer that product. We need to create it ourselves. We need to become the media, and that's one organization in Chicago that's trying to create that network of people working together so we can get the real information out to the public. Excellent. Nancy, wait, I want to get your, your voice in here one more time. Well, as we already <laughs> found, I'm not a media person. I'm a person who's more dependent That's on That's why media. I love you. <laughs> uh, but, of course, my angle is the political. Don't support the, the parties who support the corporations. Don't support the corporate parties. Support the Green Party. JP, last thought. Uh, well, again, it's just an honor uh, to be here. Uh, you know, that was really a goal when we made the film would be to get people to rally around the film where we would show it and uh, to promote the, the local independent media that's in the region. And that's exactly what's happened tonight. And uh, I couldn't be prouder of that. Uh, I just want to thank uh, you again, Bill, but also I, I want to thank um, uh, Sam Tannenbaum who made this possible, hosted me and, whole, and all of us here uh, tonight. Um, and it's just been uh, a wonderful evening and a great kickoff for our USA Media Tour. We're going to go for another 171 screenings uh, independently. So here we go. Thank and you. And we can't forget the. Um, folks, uh, films like Shadows of Liberty are rare and critical. A filmmaker and his team, the filmmaker and his team are working hard to make sure audiences across the United States have the same opportunity to attend screenings and engage in conversations about the state of our media as well as the threat to our democracy and what we can do to make it better. To keep the tour independent, the filmmaker and his team are relying on people like you to help provide fina financial support necessary to to keep the show on the road, literally to keep it on the road. They are currently in the midst of a Kickstarter fundraising campaign uh, to raise $13,500 by March 20th. Uh, if you can contribute $25, $10, $100, or any amount that is meaningful to you, it would make a huge impact. $1, $2, $3, that really makes a huge difference. Uh, you can pick up the donation envelope at the Shadows of Liberty table uh, right outside the door here, or, uh, or get, uh, get a text message with a link to the Kickstarter campaign, text SOL, S-O-L, to 581, and I'll have this information for anybody who needs it, 58124, yes sir? 58124? 58124, yes sir. Uh, there are also Shadows of Liberty DVDs for sale with proceeds, again, which would make a wonderful, wonderful gift. How much, is uh, how much are, the, uh, are the DVDs? $20. 20 Oh, that's not bad. Streaming rights at a library or any place. Yeah. Yes, that's with uh, Bullfrog Films. Bullfrog Films. So look up bullfrogfilms.org. Um, I believe it's duart.org. And I found this out. I found this out as an author that if you go to your local library and request this film, they buy the film, just yeah. like they bought, they would buy my books, and, and that's, that's an extra sale, that's extra support yes. to the filmmaker. But uh, when they screen it, that's the point. <laughs> Will they screen it? Yeah. I think we that was the point. The question was whether you could legally screen the film, the, the film which you can buy here tonight in DVD at a library, and the answer is no, because these are for home use. You could show it to your friends at home or people you invite in from the neighborhood. But it's a different licensing and the filmmaker is licensed to bullfrog films for distribution and they have a much higher licensing fee for institutions. 
just like, uh, you know, everybody needs to make a living. So. All right, and as we wrap up here, guys, uh, so we can get everybody home safely tonight before we're hit by the polar vortex, uh, in the end, ultimately, it is up to us, both in the energy and agency we take and demand in our government and in our desire to see true change. Some years ago, giving a speech at Western Illinois University out of Rwanda and Bosnia, a teacher stood up from among her students and asked me a question, and they looked at her with such expectation, and she asked, what can one person do? Um, I was momentarily taken aback uh, and then answered, Jesus. Gandhi, Mother Teresa, Nelson Mandela were all one person. We know their names, but all too often we forget about the millions who stood together where possible and alone when necessary. And that is the question fundamental to each of us. Did we stand for something? Did we make a difference? No one may answer that for you, and no one will ever hear that answer. But it will resound loudly in your own soul that you stood for the rights, the justice, and the dignity of your neighbor. Stand guard at that fire, my friends, and keep it alight for those who will follow you. Thank you for coming tonight. Please give a round of applause to uh, our congratulations. Standing guard at that fire and making it clear. And a round of applause for all of our amazing panelists. Thanks to all of you. We'll see you again soon.